So talking about facts and figures, uh, I feel that it's time for an economist. And even although we haven't done the economic analysis of the UK, we did it a couple of years ago. We were able to show that 27% of the UK's gross value add came from the open source software community. And that submarine, when we talk about the submarine, it's the home working open source community who work for international companies in most cases, in many cases, who build those skills internationally and then end up contributing locally as well as internationally. Those are the folk that create our economic environment, but we sit in this much bigger UK economic environment. And uh, I came across Will's book uh, a few weeks ago when it was first published. He had a, a much bigger audience than he has today. He was at Union Chapel in Islington, uh, pretty much rocking a stage, used to having bands on it, with himself and Keir Starmer speaking about his book launch. So clearly something that's viewed as very impactful at this uh, important moment in time. And I'm not going to spoil the plot by telling you about it, but I found as I was listening and reading um, that the alignment between the we society that Will talked about and the values of open source and open data and open hardware were absolutely paralleled. And Will, as you probably know, is a journalist and author. He currently writes for The Observer. He has been the economic editor at The Guardian and the editor-in-chief of The Observer over the years. So we're extraordinarily lucky to have him with us today and ask you to join me in the traditional way of welcoming Will to the stage. Thank you, Anna. Well, um, thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure to kind of say a few words uh, 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 as a keynote speaker, keynote in inverted commas. Um, uh, I'm just recovering from a rather heavy kind of chest cold, and I may have a coughing splutter, uh, in which case, excuse me, and I'll splutter off and then come back. Um, I've got... In, some speakers, and Winston Churchill used to say this, actually, say what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you told them. Um, so I'll, I, I kind of organise my thoughts around that. So just to, say, just to get it hammered out, um, I think that we are um, living in a crisis of British capitalism, very profound, uh, um, underinvestment, stagnating living standards and all the rest. It's the reason why there will be uh, a political upheaval tomorrow. Uh, that crisis reflects itself profoundly in the tech sector. I think we've witnessed, um, people talk about asset stripping. I think we've been witnessing the most extraordinary tech stripping. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the FTSE 100 could have been populated uh, with fantastic dynamic tech companies, but they're all owned abroad. Um, I think we need to refigure out how to do capitalism better. I think that's kind of a combining the I, the individualism of capitalism, with some we-ness. I'll explain what that means in a second. Ideas of fellowship, ideas of kind of the collective, ideas actually of openness. Uh, and then I want to spell out kind of what that means in terms of policy, both at a kind of macro level um, for kind of addressing some of the issues that the tech sector confronts at a micro level level, which I think speaks to the open source manifesto. So that's what I'm going to say, and I'll do it as quickly as I possibly can. I mean, everyone's been following the papers. Um, it varies from day to day. First NVIDIA, then Microsoft, then Apple. That one stock is worth more than the entire London stock market. Incredible, actually. Uh, then you look, you drill down a bit more, and you find that actually only 1% of the FTSE 100 is represented by companies with tech business models compared to over 30% in the United States. One versus 30. Uh, uh, there's been talk about the kind of the tech sector as it sits in the UK, a kind of submarine of kind of subcontractors, self-employed, kind of working through the open, source, the open source community to kind of buyers, many of whom are kind of overseas companies. Um, being rather innovative and vigorous, but actually, um, contributing uh, to someone else's dream. Uh, you know, we could have been, we could yet still be uh, a real player kind of in the 20th, first century uh, tech economy. And it's, it's a, such a missed opportunity uh, that it makes, it, I, I find it fantastically sad. Um, 
The, uh, uh, the reasons why that has happened um, are very similar to the larger reasons why um, we live in a country where productivity is flat, living standards are flat, growth is flat, investment's going nowhere. Um, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, actually, 1750s, we've lived through a 15-year period with no rise in living standards. I'll repeat that. For the first time since the 1750s, uh, we're living through a period where there's been no rise in living standards. And the British public are going to vote on that uh, tomorrow, and they are going to hold the Conservative government to account. And quite rightly, in my view, um, I don't hold with this um, fear that might be in Vatican a supermajority. I think the party and the philosophy that have imposed a series of catastrophes upon the British economy, uh, of which that one is the biggest, I guess, um, deserves actually to be held to account, and held to account in such a way that actually the folk memory of what's going to happen tomorrow will live on in any conservative mind for many generations to come. You govern this country well, and if you do not, you suffer profound electoral consequences. Uh, and I hope they are profound tomorrow. What are those mistakes? Those mistakes are to be fundamentally to believe that actually um, capitalism is organized around individualism. It's organized around um, uh, the, the view that if individuals, companies, consumers, workers follow their preferences and the price signals in free, in free markets, those markets will self-organize to best outcomes. So the, the policy that results from that is to keep the state as small as possible, to try to keep taxes as low as possible, um, often it's self-defeating because it's unattainable, keep regulation as minimal as possible, and uh, like the blue touch paper, and off you go. And I trace in the book um, five disasters. First of all, monetarism in the 1980s, then financial deregulation, which led to the Great Crash, then austerity, then Brexit, and then the Liz Trust fiasco all having their roots in that philosophy, culminating in what I've just described, that crisis of living standards. We've got to do capitalism better. Uh, because and here I kind of occupy quite a, a narrow intellectually, uh, a very narrow intellectual isthmus in the, uh, and I get, critiqued, I get critiqued by both right and left. Uh, I do uh, believe uh, in the dynamism the innovativeness, uh, capacity to embrace the new, uh, the wealth generating capacity of capitalism. Uh, when you go and see a, a great kind of startup, a great scale up, uh, some of you uh, may have founded them, and I'd love to come around the company and take a look. Uh, you're often very inspired. Um, uh, the founder, founders, and their people. Uh, really commit to a shared purpose. They're driving this organization forward. They're trying to make the world better from which they hope to make a great deal of money. But the big inspiration is to better the world. Uh, but there's the but. Uh, you know, the right wing are completely wrong to say that's all you need. Uh, because that's, uh, capitalism left its own devices creates incredible power imbalances. Uh, we witnessed them in the tech sector. It creates incredible instabilities. It creates phenomenal inequality. It cuts corners. It underinvests. Uh, unless you uh, superintend capitalism with regulation and proactive management and guide rails and institutions that actually represent public purpose, it, it degrades. It, it goes rogue. And actually, the story of the last 45 years, uh, with a brief interval with New Labour, who have uh, didn't quite buy into my philosophy, but nearly did. Um, that's been the story. And actually, uh, what's going to happen on tomorrow is kind of um, the biggest repudiation of that philosophy kind of ever seen in democratic politics uh, in a G7 country. Because uh, it doesn't work. And uh, the Conservative Party is going to have to do some hard thinking about where it goes from here. Um, okay. Nigel Farage, the alleged savior of the Conservative Party, uh, with his charisma and his anti-immigration posture, is also a, a Thatcherite free marketeer, precisely the philosophy that led to the, the debacle through which we're currently living. We have to reassert uh, what I call the values of fellowship, uh, mutuality, looking after each other's backs, uh, that actually the sweet spot in a capitalism is to blend, yes, individual agency and ambition, but also to leaven it. Uh, with a sense of fellowship, a sense of the we, uh, a sense of the collective, a sense of the we ha you have my back, I'll have yours. Um, it's those two philosophies 
that can be brought together um, that actually represents the sweet spot. When it's done well, I've lived in countries where it has been done well, Switzerland is one, um, Denmark is another. Uh, it works. And it, uh, this, what we're going to have to do kind of in the kind of five years in front of us and the, and the years that follow is to kind of find our way um, to that kind, of, that kind of solution. Uh, so how do you express the we? Um, and by the way, when I talk about the we, um, if you lean to the liberal left, you're immediately thinking, ah, oh, the man's a socialist. Um, uh, I do believe in an ethic of socialism, but in the same way that Clement Attlee kind of um, believed in uh, socialism. He, would, he was asked to define it. He said, oh, it's all about fellowship. Fellowship, he said, quoting William Morris, is the life of the world, the hope of the world. Uh, I ran an Oxford college for nine years. And, uh, Oxford and Cambridge colleges with their kind of roots, actually, in the monastic tradition, are run by groups of fellows. And the fellows are simultaneously incredibly solidaristic and incredibly individualistic. One of the, they, kind of, they, they are simultaneously, if you like, Thatcherites and Corbynites. Uh, and uh, the, 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 it, uh, taking the sting out of that and blending it into something that's operational is, I think, the task at hand. Um, you have to build ecosystems that represent the kind of the we, the notion of fellowship. It was, after all, Aristotle who said um, around the we, he says, kind of, uh, um, any man or woman who does not want to sh partake of society uh, and live the common life is either a beast or a god. And I don't want any part with either. And actually, uh, kind of, tech on and interestingly, I you know, go around most kind of um, founders of digital tech companies, tech companies, uh, you'll find that the, the founder and his, her kind of team uh, are almost certainly kind of recognizing that they have a, a sharedness they're recognizing living a common life. Um, they, are, they commit to a purpose to, in some way, make the world better with the technology at hand. Uh, and actually, they're going to lean into open source, because, of course, you can't do open source without a sense of fellowship. You can't do open source without a sense of fellowship. These kind of, this, 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 this manifesto, kind of under, what sits underneath it, are very profound kind of values that have their deep roots kind of in the uh, European Enlightenment and, and the Western traditions um, and need to be asserted uh, to sit alongside kind of, um, kind of the proper needs for proprietary software, kind of individual agency and I own this and all the rest. It's blending the two that actually kind of is the, is the sweet spot. So how do we get to, how do you operationalize this capitalism? Well, you have to build institutions. That's to be a kind of, you have to think about the ecosystem in which your companies are housed. Um, you certainly have to be aware of power imbalances and attack kind of overly powerful kind of monopolists. Um, you have, I think, um, to have a, 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 str a strong sense of uh, who you are uh, and a strong sense of purpose. Um, so just briefly, just to finish off this, kind of my, my, my few words, have a, a bit of a Q&A session. Um, what does that mean uh, in the here and now? Well, first of all, of course, it means that uh, you know, the UK is going to have to kind of work with um, American and, and particularly European um, comp uh, <coughs> competition regulators to kind of uh, attack kind of the abuse of uh, market power uh, by the kind of owners of the big digital platforms. Um, we can't permit uh, the kind of degree of control that they have and the way they can de kind of de determine kind of flows of data and information uh, and assert their proprietorial rights over it in the way they currently do. Secondly, secondly, one of the reasons why um, so many tech companies in the UK wound up um, being owned overseas, uh, either by trade buyers or by, by private equity, um, is because of the uh, incredibly low valuation of, um, of, of UK companies. The British stock market, which used to be one of the kind of great phenomena of the world, has actually gone from number three in the world uh, in 2000 to, um, depending on your calculus, nine, 10, or 11. It's shrunk. It's, gone fl it's flat on its back. And Barclays Bank do things called the CAPE ratio, C-A-P-E, they're higher case, you can look them up yourselves. 
Um, the valuations of UK equity are literally half those in the United States and two thirds to three quarters of those in mainland Europe. Which means if you're, if you're a startup, tech startup, and you're doing your, and you're doing your kind of first round of financing, the valuation of your earnings stream is going to be half that uh, of it if you're doing the same thing in America and two thirds of uh, what you would be doing if you were doing it in Paris or Berlin. And consequently you have to have more rounds of financing to uh, get to target sums of money and you lose control earlier, uh, um, intensified by the fact there is absolutely no market for venture debt in the UK, certainly not collateralized against intellectual property rights. Now, it is an ecosystem which is actually turns the young entrepreneurs here from being the potential founders of great companies like NVIDIA, like Apple, to people who have to sell um, as uh, kind of um, DeepMind had to do, as Dark Traders had to do, as, um, as Arm did, and a host of others. It's why there are you know, 50 companies that, got, uh, that could be in the FTSE 100 are now kind of trading outside our borders, uh, prospering, but under um, US, Japanese, or European ownership. Uh, you want some of that to happen, but you don't want it to be as extreme as the moment. We need to get uh, our stock market kind of on the move. And uh, many of you don't worry about pensions. I, don't, I expect it'll be the last time you will be mentioned in this conference, actually. The British pension funds only invest 2% of their assets in UK companies. I'll repeat that. There's about 2.6, 2.7 trillion pounds in British pension funds. Only 2% of that is invested in UK companies. There's been a flight from risk taking, and it's led to an ossified kind of um, declining stock market, which casts its pull across um, everything that happens startups, scale ups, second, third round financing, the whole damn piece. Uh, nor is there any corporate venturing to speak of. You know, it is, a, it is an absolute kind of sclerotic system. I need to open it up. I have ideas I set out in the book about how to do that. I put some on the table, actually, in a, in a, in a column in the Observer on, on Sunday, and I was delighted that I got a text from a member of the Shadow Cabinet um, saying, interesting piece, Will. We think we might do some of this. Uh, essentially, I'm arguing for the consolidation um, of all these tiny pension funds, uh, ones that are ceased a new entrance, they're called defined benefit in the jargon, to become what part of the pension protection fund, a great big mega fund that can actually diversify and consequently take more risk and invest in British equity. And the same thing has to happen uh, in the world of defined contribution funds for those of you um, who follow all this. If you think I didn't, I didn't, I've come to this conference not to talk about this obscure world of pension funds, what the hell, why is that happening? Why am I here? If, you, if we don't solve that, in 15 years' time, um, the tech sector in the UK will be as flat on its back, even flatter, than it is at the moment. Because unless we revive the, unless we revive the valuations of UK equity, unless we put our savings and kind of into kind of things that are risky, uh, in the hope of growing great companies of tomorrow, we're lost. And lastly, um, I want to come back to kind of when I was ushered in the Open Source Manifesto, openness, open source, purpose, fellowship. Um, this has implications for how one organizes oneself at the micro level. Um, we're doing a piece of research for the personal company that I co-chair, looking at the entire ecosystem. Here's a fact for you. Um, Britain's created more unicorns per head than any other country in the world, including China and the United States. In fact, we have cumulatively had 144. Fantastic. Many of these unicorns, and we're, doing, we're going to try and find out the answer if we can say, well, it's all of them. But most of the ones that we've actually kind of managed to interrogate and from the published material, uh, and some of them are on the record of saying it, are all, are all would uh, lay their, uh, the reasons for their success uh, at the door of being highly purposeful, a profound purpose. They follow that Aristotelian maxim, and they're trying to make the world incrementally better. They want to, they've got a great idea. They want to try and build a company. They're going to, yes, they're going to try and make money out of it. And it would be better if the valuations were much higher. But the big idea is to do that, is to make the world better. And actually, um, here I think there's, there's great sounds for hope. Because in a way, in the, given it's back against the wall, and the British tech community has had to be, um, to kind of be innovative, um, to be competitive, to come up with ideas. It's had to share. It's had to be open source. It's, it's had to kind of think in those terms. 
It's had to be open. Uh, and that is a kind of marry that with purpose. Marry that with purpose. Um, provide, create an ecosystem a kind of, in which there are, there are the financing options um, to scale without giving up control as soon as we do at the moment. And, kind of, and, and make sure that public authority is kind of in, um, protecting ones from the kind of aggression of the powerful as you attempt to grow and, and don't take you out. Put all that together. Britain um, could, in the next generation, kind of become the tech powerhouse of Europe. And it could create a capitalism of which other Europe, European countries would, would be envious. And indeed, I think, um, both the Chinese and the United States might want to have a bit of the action that we could create. Thank you very much.